Well, welcome back. Uh, this is our last week. Uh, what we're going to do this week is talk about skepticism. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time asking this question, what is knowledge? Uh, we made a reasonable amount of progress, right? We ruled out a lot of views that can't be right. Um, and we also ended up with some necessary conditions, right? Knowing that knowledge requires truth, requires belief, and some kind of justification is, is not non-trivial, right? That's, that's interesting, helpful, relevant information. Um, so even if we're left wondering at the end of the day, um, uh, what that fourth anti gettier condition exactly is, uh, still we've learned a lot about knowledge. And moreover, you'll recall that we're really good at identifying cases of knowledge from cases of non-knowledge. And so we can meaningfully ask the question, do we have any knowledge at all, even if we're somewhat uncertain about just how to solve uh, the Gettier problem. Uh, a couple of notices before we go on. Again, uh, we really value your feedback on the course, so uh, fill out C2 evaluations when you get a chance. Um, also, we'll be making the sample exam visible uh, sometime very soon, within the week, I expect. So you'll know just what to anticipate um, for the final exam. Okay. So you recall when we started discussing um, epistemology and I began introducing it to you, uh, I introduced you to what is reasonably thought to be the common sense point of view, the point of view that anyone would have upon initially considering epistemological questions, questions like, what do I know? And to that kind of question, right, there'd be a lot of answers given in a lot of different categories. Right? People think they know things about their immediate environment. Right? You think you know things about this room, about what's going on outside, and so forth. You think you know things about your own thoughts and feelings. Uh, think you know things about the world, generally, scientific facts, and on and on. Right? We had the list. Uh, we think we know at least some things in some of these categories. And, the more ambitious or confident among us think we know a lot of things in perhaps all these categories. Right? But whatever your particular position happens to be, you think you know at least some, uh, some things in some of these categories, or at least in your less reflective moments when you're not thinking philosophically, you'd say yes to a lot of questions uh, with regard to what do you know. All right. um, there's this further question. Uh, you know, what do we know and how do we know? And again, we drew attention to the fact that when it comes to our most fundamental ways of investigating the world, coming to know things about the world, we have these, uh, forming beliefs on the basis of our perceptual experiences, right? It's largely your perce perceptual experiences that you rely on for your information about your immediate environment. It's your visual experiences, your auditory experience, and so forth that gives you the details about what what it's like here now in this room. Right, you rely on memory for a lot of knowledge as well, knowledge of what you did this morning, knowledge of what you did yesterday, and so forth. Um, introspection is what you rely on with regard to knowledge about yourself, right, how you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you believe, what you doubt, what you hope, what you fear, so on. Uh, reason and rational insight, reasoning, Right? The use of arguments to gain knowledge and testimony. Um, we discussed these at further length earlier, so I hope this is just helpful by way of triggering your memory. Um, right. So skepticism in its various forms challenges this common sense point of view. It says that this um, very familiar, very common, fairly widely held perspective about what we know and how we know is mistaken in some way or other. It's mistaken in some way or other. Uh, first thing uh, we need to do is just a, a short bit of bookkeeping. Um, skepticism is used, the term skepticism is used in kind of everyday talk, typically to express doubt in some way or other. Right? When you say I'm skeptical about that, typically what you mean is I doubt that or I'm not very confident in that. So you might say I'm skeptical about the existence of ghosts or that so-and-so will win the election. Um, but in philosophical usage, um, it's a technical term. Uh, it means that there is no knowledge in some domain or other. 
there is no knowledge in some domain or other. Um, so we'll make that a bit more precise. Right, so on the one hand, right, you've got a version of skepticism that's referred to as practical or Peronian skepticism. And this version of skepticism uh, isn't skeptical, uh, it doesn't take a stand on what we know. It refuses to affirm or deny knowledge. Um, different way of thinking about it is it's a way of being agnostic about the question, about questions of knowledge and the extent of our knowledge. Another way of thinking about it is it's a version of skepticism that denies that we have any knowledge of knowledge. Right? Maybe we have knowledge. Maybe you know that there's a chair in front of you. Maybe you know you're sitting near someone. Maybe you know there's a seat underneath you or soon to be. Um, but you can't know that you know this. Right? So while there might be knowledge, there can't be knowledge of knowledge. Right? So the Peronian takes this kind of stance. Um, but then there's those oops, pardon me, um, that go the step further. They just say there is no knowledge. Right? Not only is there not knowledge of knowledge, there's just not knowledge, period. Right? So maybe, uh, so the Peronian might say, yeah, maybe you know there's a chair underneath you, but we can't know that you know that. Uh, the theoretical skeptic says you can't even know that. Uh, theoretical skepticism comes in a couple varieties, uh, global and local. Uh, the global skeptic says that there's no knowledge about anything. So you remember that list of categories uh, earlier? People typically think they know things about scientific facts and their immediate environment, their own thoughts and feelings, and you know, that, that long list a bit ago. Well, the global skeptic says there's no knowledge in any of these categories, right? So across the board, there is no knowledge. Uh, but that's not the only way to be a skeptic. Uh, you don't have to be so sweeping in your declaration that there is no knowledge in order to be a skeptic in a meaningful sense of the term. Um, so this, is the, this, is, this variety of skepticism is referred to as local skepticism, right? It's restricted. Uh, it says that there's no knowledge in this area or that area. So you might say, um, we know some things, right? Maybe we know things about our immediate environment, but we don't know anything about morality. Or you might say, we know, maybe we know some things about our immediate environment, but we don't know anything about religion. Or maybe we know some things about our immediate environment, uh, but we don't know anything about the future uh, or the past. Or, right? you, you just pick the domain, right? You pick the arena, you pick the category. Right? And you could say, there's no knowledge there. But we're gonna, focus on um, in the next two lectures is uh, local theoretical skepticism. Uh, so it's theoretical because it's a denial of knowledge, not just knowledge of knowledge. Uh, and it's local because it's going to be restricted to uh, facts about our immediate environment. Right. So this is kind of an interesting form of skepticism to, to to think about because uh, typically what's not controversial is that you know things about your immediate environment. Right? People don't typically doubt whether or not they know there's a chair near them or people near them or that they're hearing someone speak. Uh, so if there are good arguments for being a skeptic about these kinds of facts, then we probably don't know much of anything at all. So, in other words, if we know anything, it's extremely plausible to think we know things about our immediate environment, like there's some physical objects around us, and we know the character of those objects. Um, but if we don't even know that, then how could we know anything about the future, anything about the past, anything about scientific facts, right? Because science rides on the back of facts about observation, right? You read the test results. You see the, how the experiment comes out. If you can't know anything about your immediate environment, then a whole lot goes out the window. So this is a really interesting version of skepticism to concern ourselves with. Uh, any questions about those categories? Um, yeah, that's all pretty straightforward, but very helpful because it 
helps keep us all on the same page. Now, the skeptic has got one powerful tool in his toolbox, or her toolbox, and it's something that's seemingly uncontroversial, uh, that skeptical scenarios are conceivable. All right, what do, what do I mean by skeptical scenario? Well, a skeptical scenario is any situation in which appearances depart from reality in some way. So it's when things appear one way, but they're not that way at all. Uh, so appearance and reality comes apart. It comes apart. Now, if you, now we might be, uh, or excuse me. So yeah, skeptical scenarios are just possible situations where appearance and reality separate. And if you're in a skeptical scenario, right? If you're in a situation where appearances and reality separate, then you lose knowledge. Then you typically lose knowledge, right? If you're in the matrix. Things are going to seem one way, right? You're going to give someone a high five. It's going to seem like you've just given someone a high five. But you haven't made physical contact with anyone. Reality and appearances separate. And so you can't know that you've given anyone a high five, much less make contact with anyone. So knowledge is lost within the skeptical scenario. But what's clever about the skeptic is that they use the mere possibility of skeptical scenarios. Right, they don't argue that skeptical scenarios are real. They don't think that you're in the matrix. They just leverage the fact that it's possible and try and show that the mere possibility robs us of knowledge. We'll see how that happens in just a second. Um, now, there's obviously a lot of possible skeptical scenarios. Um, so you'll recall, recall having to read Descartes he talked about his vivid dreams, right? Uh, those many times, he says, in which he's dreamed he was in his bedchamber, and the fire burning, the candles lit, and so on. I forget how the, the description exactly goes. Well, we've all had very vivid dreams. Um, couldn't we have a vivid dream that we're in a philosophy lecture now? Maybe it's a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> um, Descartes talks about his evil genius, uh, right? Someone who's uh, exceptionally powerful, godlike in their powers, and it's bent on deceiving you. So they make it seem like life goes on as normal, but nothing of the sort is happening. It seems like there's a tree, but there is no tree. This evil genius or demon is just bent on deceiving you. Okay. Right, we're all familiar with the Matrix. If not, Watch it on Netflix between this and the next lecture. Um, less fantastically, uh, you know, you've got the Truman Show. Right? Truman For Truman, reality and appearance departed quite a bit. Right? There are people in his life he thought were his friends, but really they were just actors who were paid to act like friends. You're not a friend if you're acting like a friend. Or, pardon me, uh, just because you're acting like a friend doesn't entail that you are a friend. And for... Truman, that's how a lot of his friends, right, friends with quotes, actor friends were. Um, the scenario that we're going to focus on primarily, though, is what's called the brain in the vat scenario. Um, no, no special reason for this. It's just one that's captured a philosopher's imaginations for some reason. Um, the idea that, you know, a, a brain could be taken out of a human body uh, sustained so that it lives and stimulated in all ways so that for the brain it just seems like life goes on as normal. Um, so the computer can sim stimulate the brain in such a way that uh, it, the brain thinks it's in a body and thinks it's going for a jog when really no such thing is happening. It's just being stimulated in a way that makes it seem like they're running and going for an enjoyable jog. So brain the bat scenarios. All right. So big lesson from skeptical scenarios is this: the vast majority of our evidence is possibly misleading. And so when we reflect on skeptical scenarios, right, these possible situations, right, probably not actual, but they're possible. Right? They, they could be in some sense. The big lesson to learn is that. Our evidence, the vast majority of it, 
is possibly misleading. Right. So when we're talking about evidence, we're just talking about reasons for belief. Reasons for belief. Right. So again, this just takes us back to perceptual experiences, introspective experiences, and so forth. And when we talk about evidence being possibly misleading, we're just talking about situations in which you have your same evidence, but things aren't as your evidence indicates. So when you're in the matrix or if you're in a, a brain in a vat and you seem to give someone a high five, your evidence is not merely possibly misleading, it's actually misleading. But none of you are in the matrix, none of you are brains and vats, so when you give someone near you a high five, your evidence isn't misleading, right? You really do give someone a high five. But nevertheless, it's possibly misleading. That is, you can have that same evidence that you actually have. Right? Why do you think you give a high five to or when you give a high five to someone, what's your reason for believing you've given them a high five? Well, you see it happen, you feel it happen, but you can have the same visual experience and the same tactile experience without actually having given someone a high five. That's what everyone in the matrix experiences. That's what every brain in the vat experiences when they seem to give someone a high five. Right. So even though your evidence isn't actually misleading, because none of you are in the matrix, it's nevertheless possibly misleading. Um, here are a couple less fantastical scenarios. So um, uh, you've got the Mueller liar illusion. Uh, you've got these two lines here. And so there's this question, everyone who, uh, has anybody seen these before? Uh, well, that's too bad, most of you. Um, well, it, 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 there was some point in time at which you were initially exposed to them. And when you were initially exposed to them, uh, and perhaps now um, still, uh, it seems like one is longer than the other. Right? When you just look at them, one just seems longer. Um, but they're not. Uh, they're, they're of equal length. And the arrows on the ends just sort of dupe your visual uh, uh, capacities into thinking that one's longer than the other. Similarly, the Mueller liar, um, pardon me, the cafe wall illusion. Interestingly, Melbourne has uh, one of the buildings in the uh, uh, downtown painted like this, near the Etihad Stadium. Um, it looks like they're not parallel, right? It looks like they're verging towards each other. But when in fact, they're actually all you know, parallel. So again, these are cases where your evidence, right, in, in this suppose you didn't know that these are illusions, right? So you're in an enriched evidential situation because you know that these are illusions, so. But in your previous unenriched state upon first encountering, right, you just have indeed misleading evidence. So this is evidence that is actually misleading. Appearances are indeed departing from reality. Right. So then here's a question. Uh, is there any kind of evidence we could have that isn't possibly misleading? Right? I've just given you a bunch of scenarios where your evidence could be misleading. And I've given you one pair of scenarios where your evidence is indeed misleading, right? the, uh, the visual illusions. Um, is there any realm of evidence that isn't possibly misleading? Uh, is there anything you can't be mistaken about? So obviously, perceptual experiences aren't going to be in the mix because your perceptual experiences are always going to be possibly misleading. Right? That's the lesson of the skeptical scenarios. Right? So perceptual experiences are out the window. What about testimony, right? So a lot of evidence we get is on the basis of what other people tell us. Um, clearly, that's possibly misleading, right? People can tell us false things, so testimonial evidence is possibly misleading. Um, what about memory? Can, is memory possibly misleading? Yeah, we misremember things all the time. Um, anything? Yeah, yeah. If there's any kind of evidence that isn't possibly misleading, it's going to be limited to something like introspection. Um, so your awareness of how things are going on with you in the inside. 
right? So could you be mistaken right now that you're not presently in blindingly agonizing pain? Here's a different way of appreciating the difference. Um, right, we might be mistaken about whether or not one line is longer than the other or whether or not the lines are parallel. But could you be mistaken about the fact that it visually seems like one line's longer or that the lines are not parallel? Right, what, would it, what, what could it mean for that to be misleading? Right, notice, uh, it does seem like one line is longer than the other in the Mueller liar illusion. So how could your evidence about that be misleading? Well, remember what it means for evidence to be misleading. It's for there to be cases where you have your evidence, but what it's evidence for doesn't obtain. So it would have to be a situation in which it visually seems like one line's longer than the other but it doesn't visually seem like one line's longer than the other. Now, that should sound like a contradiction. Uh, it's very difficult to see how you could be mistaken about how things seem, though it's very easy to see how you could be mistaken about how things are. All right. Any questions about that point? Now, let's see how we get to skepticism from here. Um, all right, this is re referred to as the Cartesian skeptical argument, not because Descartes was a skeptic, but because Descartes' thoughts on epistemology have inspired this kind of argument. So this will be reminiscent from things, um, you know, I briefly mentioned this in an earlier lecture. So you know something only if your evidence is not possibly misleading. All right, so introduce this as a constraint on knowledge. Right, there's never knowledge where your evidence might be misleading you. Uh, perceptual evidence, however, is possibly misleading. Right? That's the big lesson from matrix scenarios, bring the bat scenarios, and so forth. Um, so you have no perceptual knowledge. And if you have no perceptual knowledge, um, well, what we end up with is a version of skepticism. What kind of skepticism? Well, it's local theoretical skepticism um, about the external world. Why the external world? When we say external world, what we're talking about is the world outside of our minds, right? Um, facts, uh, to be skeptic about the external world, it's to be skeptic about whether or not you can have knowledge about chairs and carpet and whether or not you have hands and so on and other things besides, right? If you can't know that you have hands, then surely you can't know that you performed an experiment with your hands, or uh, if you can't know that you have hands, then you can't know that you have eyes either, and if you can't know that you have eyes, then you can't know that your eyes are accurately detecting the results of some scientific experiment, so you can't have scientific knowledge. All right. So, um, Lots of knowledge is lost. Lots of knowledge is lost. Let's see. Yeah. All right, so here's my question for you. Um, I suspect you're not skeptics about the external world. I suspect you're not skeptics, skeptics about material objects. I think you all think you know that you have hands. I think you all think you know that you have feet. I think you all think you know that there's a chair underneath you, that you're hearing someone speak, and so forth. Uh, but notice that this is a, a deductively valid argument. That is, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. So you have to give up on a premise if you're going to say, yeah, I know what I think I know. Right? You can't be happy with the premises and deny the conclusion. Right? That's incoherent. That involves a contradiction. Uh, so here's my question to you, and I'd like you just to briefly talk with the person nearest to you. Um, what premise would you like to put pressure on? Or if you want to retain your common sense point of view, if you want to think you know some things about your immediate environment, um, then you got to reject something here. So what do you want to reject, and what reasons can you give for that rejection? All right, so have your discussion.
So let's see where you're at. Um, so right, you've only got two options because uh, <laughs> there's two premises. So you got you have to reject one of the two premises, obviously. Um, so who, who who wants to give up on premise one? All right, uh, majority of you. Uh, who wants to give up on premise two? All right, one. Um, any of you feel comfortable sharing your reasons for wanting to give up on one or two? Good. So it sounds like um, uh, the thought is that what premise one is mistaking is uh, the relevance of the fact that our evidence is possibly misleading. This should force us to be skeptics about whether or not we know. Pardon me. Whether or not we know that we know, but not whether or not we know. All right. So yeah, there is a way of transforming this into an argument for a Peronian or practical skepticism. And again, as we saw earlier, Peronian or practical skepticism does leave intact knowledge of the world. <laughs> but what you lose is knowledge of knowledge. All right. Um, good, good. Uh, other thoughts on premise one? I guess what, oh yeah. Oh, so don't reject any. Uh, oh, so no knowledge. All right, interesting. So when you say all, it all seems perfectly reasonable. Um, so that, that means you're, you're cool with the conclusion because it logically follows from the premises. So you're, you're pretty happy thinking that you don't know that you're sitting near someone. Uh, <laughs> well, there is um, uh, perhaps, and, and certainly is something to the thought that we shouldn't be presumptuous about what we know. Uh, we sh still should be, or at least it does seem a bit dramatic to move from the fact that I've made a lot of errors to I know absolutely nothing. Um, and that's what the conclusion says. Uh, not that you're sitting near someone, not that you're in a chair, not that you turned out to lecture. You don't know that, uh, right, all sorts of things. Um, and, uh, well, it's, it's, it feels a bit dramatic. Uh, we'll talk about the drama in a bit. Yeah. Could you possibly say that the first premise is just about the general? So he says that it's not possible to believe. Um, but then I think if you start from there, then pretty much um, the only thing you're allowed to do is sort of Yeah, right. You can't know that the sun will rise tomorrow. So is your thought, um, it's too general in the sense that if you, uh, so if it's true, then right, we know next to nothing because right, virtually all of our evidence is possibly misleading with the exception of introspection. Um, and if we don't know anything uh, with when our knowledge is, or presumed knowledge is based on misleading evidence, then right, we can't know that the sun will rise tomorrow. We can't know that we'll be safe if we cross the street after looking both ways and seeing no cars in sight, and we can't know, right, on and on. And, uh, and that raises practical problems for life, uh, right, because you perhaps should only act on a belief if that belief is knowledge or something. It's also 
Good, good. So um, in that last comment, uh, one of the major points is that uh, why should we take the fact that we might be wrong so seriously? Right, we can con concoct really wild, like the matrix scenario is a wild scenario. Uh, the brain in the vet scenario is a wild scenario. Uh, the Truman Show scenario is a wild scenario. Um, maybe a little less wild than the previous two, but they're all pretty far out there. So why should we take these mere possibilities so seriously? In the sense that, why should the mere possibility of error rob us of knowledge? That's what adhering to this criterion says. The mere possibility robs us of knowledge. Um, so here, here are a couple points. So there are perhaps three points. Uh, the one is, why take the mere possibility of knowledge uh, poss possibility of error so seriously, right? Possibilities are just possibilities and the skeptical scenarios are pretty far out. Uh, secondly, um, can you know infallibilism is true? Right, what's your reason for thinking infallibilism is right? Uh, well, maybe it, it appeals to you, right? It feels intuitive or something. But if you're basing your commitment to the infallibilist premise, premise one, well, you're basing your belief on evidence that's possibly misleading, right? Because our intuitions do mislead us. And so if the first premise is true, uh, okay, but you shouldn't think it's true because your evidence for it is possibly misleading. So it's a self-defeating position to hold. Right? The premise says you can't know something if it's based on possibly misleading evidence. But your evidence for that is possibly misleading, right? So it wouldn't be rational for you to believe it. Now notice that's not an objection to the truth of it. It still might be true, uh, but it's definitely not rational to maintain, right? It's an, it's an epistemically self-defeating proposition. Do you see the point? Yeah, good. Second point. Moore's point is that uh, it's just false. Um, and here's, here's uh, I mean, we'll, we'll develop Moore's point a bit more next lecture, but his basic thought is this. We know things, right? There are just some things that we do know about our immediate environment. Uh, you know that you're sitting in something. Now, if you know that you're sitting in something, then you have some perceptual knowledge, right? Because your, no, your knowledge that you're sitting on something is based on perception. That is possibly misleading, right? Your, evidence, your perceptual evidence is possibly misleading. So you know something, and that knowledge is based on possibly misleading evidence. So knowledge must not require evidence that isn't possibly misleading. All right, so this is Moore's point. Now that should feel a little funny to you. It should feel question begging. If you don't know what question begging is, then next lecture we'll clarify that. But that's Moore's point. Moore's point is just look, we, we know all sorts of things about the world. Maybe we don't know as much as we hope. Maybe we don't know as much as we think we do. But there are, there are some things we know on the basis of possibly misleading evidence. And all you need is one item of knowledge based on possibly misleading evidence to refute premise one. Moore likes the proposition, I have hands. You could pick anything. I have hair, or I have glasses on, I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter. But so long as there's one item of knowledge that's based on possibly misleading evidence, the premise is false. All right. um, so here's a different argument for skepticism about the external world or skepticism about material objects. Um, the phrase external worlds and material objects are meant to indicate the same thing because the external world is supposed to be constituted of material objects. And here's the skeptical argument. Um, you know you have hands only if you know you're not a brain in a bat. You don't know you're not a brain in a bat. So you don't know that you have hands. You know you have hands only if you know you're not a brain in a bat. You don't know that you're not a brain in a vat, so you don't know that you have hands. Um, 
Uh, this argument is uh, deductively valid. It's modus tollens. Uh, so the, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Um, notice that there's no infallibilist assumption here, right? So infallibilism uh, isn't the only way to reaching the conclusion that we should be skeptics about the external world. And now you notice that the conclusion doesn't say skeptics about the external world. It just says you don't know that you have hands. But notice that the argument generalizes. If you don't know that you have hands, what in the world could you know about your immediate environment? What, what else are you more well acquainted with in your immediate environment than your hands? Uh, if you don't know that you have hands, then you know virtually nothing else about the external world. Right? But we just pick on the hands example because it helps us, gives us something specific to focus on. But the problem is quite general. We could have talked about chairs, we could have talked about hair, we could have talked about coats, we could have talked about anything, ceilings, floors. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and make this argument as persuasive to you as possible. Um, persuasive to you as possible. So let's think about the premises. All right, so you've got premise one. You know you have hands only if you know you're not a brain in a vat. All right, so first of all, you, you want to pick up on the logical relationship between the statement, you have hands, and the statement, you're not a brain in a vat. Um, they're logically incompatible. I'll show you some other examples. Uh, oh, excuse, excuse me, what's logically incompatible is that you have hands and you're a brain in a vat. Um, you have hands and you're a brain in a vat. So here, here are some other pairs of sentences. Um, every AFL team has players. Some AFL teams don't. My vehicle is a physical object. Physical objects don't exist. You're in a university classroom. This university has no room. Right. Both sentences in each pair can't be true, and it's obvious to us that this is the case. If the first one's true, then the second one's not. If the second one's true, then the first one's not. Uh, same thing with you have hands and you're a brain in a vat. Right. It can't be true that you have hands and also true that you're a brain in a vat. Because if you're a brain in a vat, well, then you're just a brain floating in a vat. You have no body, so you have no hands. All right, so here's a question to consider. Uh, could you know, say, that the first sentence is true? Right? So for example, that AFL, every AFL team has players, or that your vehicle is a physical object, or that you're in a university classroom. Could you know the first sentence, and yet fail to know that the second one isn't true? So if you know that the first sentence is true, does that mean, or does that require, that you have knowledge that the second is false? Right, so why don't you turn to the person sitting next to you, register your thoughts. What do you think about this? Can you know one is true and yet not know the other is false? Right, so that's the question. So I wish I could give you just a few more moments to register your thoughts, but um, we're just running quickly towards the time. Um, can I just see uh, a show of hands? Uh, who, have you th who among you thinks that if you know the first is true, then you have to know that the second is false, at least upon considering it? Right? A lot of you are feeling the 
the persuasiveness of the points. Uh, the exclusion principle is meant to capture this, all right, so that in order to know something, right, in order to know P, you have to be able, on the basis of your evidence, to rule out or exclude or put differently, know to be false. Any proposition that you know is incompatible with P. Right, this is just a slightly more general way of making this point, right? The point that you, many of you wanted to make in response to my question. That if you know every AFL team has players, then you know that it's false, that some teams don't. If you know that your vehicle is a physical object, then you know that it's false, the physical objects don't exist. Because right, you know that if the first is true, the second has to be true. But the exclusion principle, principle is meant to capture this. All right. uh, why believe it? Well, obviously it's intuitive. And its denial is extremely counterintuitive. Right. So uh, Keith DeRose draws us out in what he calls abominable conjunctions. Right. He says, if you give up on the exclusion principle, this is what you end up having to be committed to. Things like this. I know I have hands, but I don't know that I'm a handless brain in a bat. Uh, I know my car is parked in my driveway, right? I know my car is parked in my driveway, but I don't know that my car hasn't been stolen or replaced with a replica. I know I'm talking to my mother on the phone, but I don't know that she hasn't been abducted and I'm not talking to her abductor through a voice filter that sounds just like my mom. Um, DeRose's point is that these conjunctions, these pairs of propositions, just seem wildly um, uh, counterintuitive. Right? It can't be true that you have knowledge in the one instance and fail to have knowledge that the other is false. But this, again, is just to highlight the point you were all sort of initially appreciating, that knowledge in the one case entails that you know some other things are false when you recognize what's known is incompatible with those other things. All right, so that's premise one. Um, if you know you have hands, then you know you're not a brain in a bat. All right, so if the exclusion principle is true, premise one is true. And many of you are feeling the tug of this. All right, so premise one seems to be on not bad footing. What about premise two? You don't know you're not a brain in a bat. Well, let's ask the question. Um, if you know you're not a brain in a vat, how do you know that? All right, premise says two is a denial of knowledge. Premise two says you don't know you're not a brain in a vat. So if you want to challenge this, you want to say, no, I do know I'm not a brain in a vat. So if you know you're not a brain in a vat, or alternatively, we could change the scenario, you know you're not in the matrix, you're no, you know you're not in anything like the Truman Show, and so forth. You know you're not being deceived by an evil demon. If you know this stuff, right, if you know you're not in any of these skeptical scenarios, how do you know it? I mean, I, I take it you all believe none of these skeptical scenarios obtain. But what's your evidence? Right? Why do you reject the skeptical scenarios? Anybody? I take it you do reject them, <laughs> right? I, you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident none of you believes you're in the matrix. Or at least those of you who believe you're in the matrix don't also believe you're being deceived by an evil demon. Or at least if you do, then uh, there, there's some skeptical scenario you believe you're not in. Oh, on what basis do you believe you're not in the skeptical scenario at issue? All right, well, I suspect the answer is, well, I just haven't thought about it, um, or it's too unusual, it's too far-fetched. Um, maybe this, I have no evidence that I am in such a scenario, right? But just because there's no evidence that you are doesn't mean you're not, and you believe you're not. So what's your evidence? What's your evidence? Um, Here's the first observation 
or uh, actually the only observation. Um, any kind of evidence you can pull out to defend the fact that you're not in a skeptical scenario like the brain and the vet scenario or the matrix um, is evidence that you'd have even if you were in the skeptical scenario. All right, let me say it again. Uh, whatever evidence you can put forth as evidence for thinking you're not in a skeptical scenario is evidence you'd have within the skeptical scenario. Right, so you might say, I know I'm not in the matrix because um, I, I haven't seen any evil computers around putting people in vats. Um, and we have good reason to think technology is up to that point. I mean, technology is not up to that point, if it ever could be. But right, if you were in the matrix, you'd have that same evidence. Right, you still wouldn't have encountered any computers that smart yet. Um, uh, it's hard to see, in other words. What, what evidence you could produce here now for thinking you're not in a skeptical scenario that you couldn't also have if you were within the skeptical scenario. And if you could have your evidence within the skeptical scenario, then obviously your evidence is compatible with the skeptical scenario. Um, and here's a very intuitive thought about the nature of evidence. Um, if your evidence is compatible with something and does not decrease its likelihood, then your evidence can't give you a reason to reject that something. Right, so if your evidence for thinking you're not in the matrix is compatible with you being in the matrix, and if your evidence for thinking you're not in the matrix doesn't decrease the likelihood that you're not, uh, excuse me, the decreased likelihood that you are in the matrix, then your evidence isn't actually evidence that you're not in the matrix. Um, let me just illustrate it a different way, a way that's um, going to latch on to observations from next lecture. Uh, you might think that, well, look, um, if I'm in the matrix and I'm not touching a chair, but look, I am touching a chair, so my evidence for thinking I'm not in the matrix is this. I've got evidence that I'm touching a chair. If I'm touching a chair, then I'm not in the matrix. But look, what's, what's really your evidence? Well, it's the fact that you're having a certain tactile experience and a certain visual experience, maybe auditory, right? You hear it. Um, but you could hear it, you could have the auditory experience, you can have the tactile experience, you can have the visual experience, all within the matrix. So your evidence is compatible with being in the skeptical scenario. And the evidential principle says, if your evidence is fully compatible with being in the skeptical scenario, then your evidence doesn't give you a reason to th think you're not in the skeptical scenario. Right. And if that's all your evidence, then uh, you don't know you're not in the matrix. Right. So premise two follows from the, the observation here on this evidential principle. Okay. All right, so here's where we end up. Uh, we've got this argument. It's fortified by pretty reasonable premises. It doesn't rest on infallibilism, right, which is a questionable assumption. And so if you want to resist a sweeping skepticism, uh, you've got to do one of these four things, or one of these three things. Uh, you've got to give up the exclusion principle. Um, but remember, the exclusion principle is pretty intuitive, right? So giving that up is going to be challenging. If you want to give up premise two, well, then you have to either reject the evidential principle or appeal to some kind of evidence that you actually have that is incompatible with the skeptical scenario, or at least decreases the likelihood that you're in the skeptical scenario. All right, we'll talk more about that next time. Uh, if you can't do any of that, then you're in trouble, right? Then skepticism follows, and your solution really, your fourth solution really isn't a solution. It's more like uh, uh, accepting. Uh, I mean, you just have to accept the conclusion. Um, and so this is what we're going to do next time. See if there's not a plausible way out of this particular skeptical argument. It's quite plausible. It's fortified by good premises. Uh, Moore thinks he has a way out of it. 
Um, we'll see how that goes next time. All right. See you guys in a couple days.